This podcast contains adult language, descriptions of violence, sexual references, and other possibly offensive themes. Listener discretion is advised. Welcome to this episode of Back to the Story, where friends come together to play Dungeons and Dragons. I'll be your DM, Klaus. Let's get started. When you see God's Rust surrounded by armies, I'm sorry, I couldn't buy us more time. Then know that its desolation has come near. I, I mean, I have great faith in the gods. I think that no matter what happens, they're going to triumph over this. Then let those who are upon the pinnacle flee to the mountains. And it's not really our place to judge, but to serve. And let those who are inside the city depart. I think if you gave me a few days, I could learn enough deep speech to try. Then let not those who are out in the forest into it. I'm an archaeologist. Disrespecting the dead is kind of what I do. For these are the days of vengeance. I just want to know what the fuck I am. To fulfill all that is written. Do not heed the visions of false prophets. Do not become what they want you to become. All right, Scales. It's up to you now. You've got this. I was going to say something, but I can't remember. So I'll say it later when I remember. Episode 64, Old Business. The ship slowly pushes through the cracking ice, the hole protected by a plow of metal. A frozen and snapped ship is passed by on the left as a glacier clarifies in the distance. Past the snowstorm and the frozen mist, the glacier slopes up, and atop it, the peak of a great obelisk can be seen. Frosted anchors are tossed onto the ice as the crew disembarks. They have glowing eyes and are led by a slender and short individual. The leader walks forth, with a robe and hood lined with orange stitching, glowing hot like coals. Steam gently rolls out of the warming hood, revealing a humanoid figure, with a bald gray head, overly large dark eyes, and a goatee of white. The expedition pushes past bodies of frost strolls quickly being covered by the snow, and up a sloping glacier. There the monolith reaches up a hundred feet, with the strange yet simple glyphed carvings upon what appears to be crystalline ice. At the peak of the obelisk, a black sphere glows strange black light, reaches up in a stream towards the sky. The hooded figure looks up to see a constellation of stars connected to the monolith. On the glacier, numerous massive bodies of frost giants are frozen solid and skeletal in patterns, as if given sacrifice to a frozen ritual of death. A frost mist of slow wind shifts around the base of the monolith as the hooded leader directs pointing. Two glowing eyes archers move forward cautiously towards the mist, yet as they near it, the mist takes shape into a great cluster of plant matter and vines reaching out with thorns of ice, snatching the scouts with vines of mist as they are frozen solid and their bodies decomposed to the bone. Remembrance of Grath and Torek, Scouts of Operation Relic. Previously, as the Bronze Scales attempt to finish old business in Embershore, they found themselves defeated in the Copper Sail, erupting into an argument between Ellery and Felix about Sarnellus before Amson played therapist El Bellary. Ball then sought seclusion in his wooded camp outside the city, while Amson and Ellery negotiate a deal with Frank Norbell to end slavery in Embershore, spending 35,000 gold pieces to do so. Felix began work on scrolls as Ellery spoke to Storm Dreamer of the Odyssey Temple, seeing the face of Valtimeri herself in the storm. Vesper confronted and said her farewells to Roderick, and that's when we come back to the story here. Um, I know some were maybe considering some other night stuff. I think that was Amson, who is gone. Uh, so I believe, unless there's some last things, we'll pick up in the morning as the new day um, begins and you guys meet up at the Copper Cell or wherever you I, want to. I know I at least was planning on having a conversation with my family that same night rather than waiting until the morning. Okay. What well, did you want to do that? 
No. Uh, sure. And I think okay. Vesper, did Vesper also want to? Vesper did. She's also eating a sandwich right now, so okay. go ahead and go first. I will go first. In, anyone else for tonight? Okay. So this is after your temple visit? Yeah, so after the temp after the temple visit, I go home to the copper sale and I well I look for Mogther first. Is is the sale open for business again after the storm at this point, or is it still it's, closed? Down? It's reopened at this point, yeah. Okay. So naturally everyone's super busy. Uh but I'm gonna find Mogther. And first things first, when I see him I'm just going to say, hey, so I may have recommended you for a job. So if some folks from the Nexus Trust come by to see you, that's why. Oh, a legitimate job? Yeah. Oh, well. well. Um, Look at that. It seems that the winery is in need of new management. Can't say it's my style, but I could make some changes. Well, don't feel like you have to, but I figured it might be a good opportunity. Thank you. And he embraces you and kind of moves away from the bar so you can talk a little bit. Um, I will definitely hug him back and get a little bit more serious. So I need to talk to you and Shurza. Because I'm, I'm heading out tomorrow, I think. And, All right, well, um, she's in her room. That's for how long as you're kind of walking towards Scherzer's room? That's part of why I need to talk to you. I don't know. He kind of nods and then looks straight ahead. Yeah, eventually entering into Scherzer's room where uh, she's practicing with a guitar. Not very good yet, but she's been practicing with it. Closes the door behind you also you have some privacy. I smile when I see Sherza playing. She hugs you, as always. So, um we're we're heading out tomorrow and there are some things that I haven't told you to that you should both know about. Because I'm I'm not sure when I'm going to be coming back, and to be completely honest, I'm not sure if I'll be able to come back, though I certainly hope so. If you came back last time, I'm sure you'll find a way. Well, I'm going to do everything that I can to make that happen again. Um, Are we heading this time, Dragonia? <laughs> Well, first stop is up north. We're, uh, if we haven't quite figured out our direction yet, we're chasing down some information for Ball. But look, you know the stuff I told you about the pilgrimage, uh, wasn't entirely complete. And I'm going to kind of sum up for them the gist of the situation that we're facing, not in too much detail, but enough for them to understand why I'm taking all of this seriously and why I'm not sure if or how things are going to go from here. A little bit about Felnor and the will, a little bit about the prophecies. So, uh... Yeah, things are kind of a lot right now. Yeah, I'd say so. And I didn't want to tell you when I got home because I didn't want this hanging over our heads while I was here. I think... I think we always had an inkling. It kind of takes your wrist when you came to us. It was under strange circumstances, and you've always had a way about you. (sighs) Funny things happened around you when you grew up. Um, Never would have guessed this, but 
and he takes a sip from his flask he keeps on him and then offers it to you as well. I will definitely take a sip. I wish I could offer something. I don't know how helpful more lockpicks would be, but... Dad, you've done so much for me. We love you. And do what you have to, but if you can, come back. I love you too. And there's kind of a dog pile between the three of you. Uh, hug. Um, I I hug them both as hard as I can, and then I say, um, there's there's one more thing. And this part, I'm not really sure why I didn't tell you right away. But, um, Vesper helped me get in, t in contact with Mom while we were in Nymanet. What is, is she alright? Did you find out? She's, she wouldn't tell me much. It sounded like she was on the run, but that she was okay, at least for now. I, I try to check in with her every once in a while through Vesper, but she won't give me anything more, really, except what continent she's on, which is very far away. I know your mother, and she'll do what she can to get back, and I'll tell you the same thing I told her. She left that night. Go. Go wherever you need to. To the end of it all if you have to, but come back. We love you. You always have home here. This is your home. And I will always do everything I can to come back here. And they embrace you again? Um, I do... I, I have something... It's not much, but I have a way that we can, we can write mom a letter together. Um, I have this, this paper that can get to her. And I take out two sheets of the pages of secrets. So I was thinking before I leave, maybe we could sit down tonight and tell mom what we need to tell her. Whatever that is for each of us. Thank you. This is... This is a great gift. And over the next few minutes, I presume you guys go into writing the letter and including all the details you want to include. And you know, he wants to express his love and hoping that she's safe and that she comes back if she can. And tries to update her about Shurza and himself and you. What are a few things you include? I imagine that I've told her through Vesper a few things about what we were doing about Voltimary, especially. I think the main thing that I want to say to her is that I don't know when or if it would be possible, but that if I can make it through the things that I have to do first, or if I find an opportunity in everything that is ahead of me right now, that if there's any chance for me to do it, I will come and find her and help her to be able to come home. And as you... All three of you kind of include your details and your messages and um, write out this letter, filling up the pages to its maximum capacity. You guys eventually finish and say the words and expend the magic so that the scrolls um, almost burn. But instead of burning into fire and smoke, it instead turns into this sort of greenish glitter that flickers before dissipating away like the last few fireflies going out in the night um, and the room kind of glows at first green for a moment as this happens um, and eventually each last flake of the paper dissipates. And I will take Scherz's hand in one hand and Mogther's hand in the other hand. I love you so much. I know I don't say it enough, but 
I love you too. And Scherzer says as, as well, I imagine you'll embrace um, mm-hmm. for a long time. I think that's when we kind of zoom out of that scene, leaving it on that moment of embrace. Unless there's anything last, last thing, I don't want to cut you short. No, but, that was um, it. Otherwise, that seemed right. Uh, otherwise, uh, before we hop on to what sounds like Vesper, Bald, I just want to get a snapshot of what you were doing because uh, you were outside of the city in your wooded camp. Paint us a picture. What are you doing? You don't have to, but I was just... Yeah, I don't I don't know if there's necessarily anything particular that Ball is addressing right now. It might just be, from Ball's point of view, just your average kind of night in in the forest. Maybe he's, you know, kind of feeling a little more sentimental because he gets the feeling that he's going to be leaving again soon. Building your last fire in the campfire and... Exactly. Sleeping under the tree you slept so many times under before for the last time. Um, Was Ball spending his last sentimental moments in his camp outside of Embershore of Vesper? Uh, yes. Uh, as I'm leaving Rothburn Rook, I want to stop by Diaz and see if she's if she'd walk home with me, so I can just do this all at once. Okay. Yeah. Um. So yes. Yeah, so then I D and I go back to the Elixirium. I'll fill her in a little bit on what's going on and that we're leaving tomorrow and things like that, and kind of give her the basic rundown. Okay. And as you guys come into the Elixirium, you kind of see Dia and um. Varus kind of almost have this football team esque um partnership kind of thing. It's a little different for you to see, but but they greet each other um, in a funny way. Um, but they eventually turn turn to you, kind of knowing what's coming. So we're um we're leaving tomorrow morning to go uh north and find Ball's family. Hopefully, or at least more information about them. And I have to tell you about this? No. Um, books in the library, and the ball had some visions, as he was wont to do. They nod and kind of look down before Lysander. Um, when will you return? <sighs> uh, I don't know. After that, we should probably head back to Nymanet to find a way back. There's business there to deal with, and I, I told you about Felnor and the prophecies that Felix shared with us a little. Yes, are you sure about him? Strangely, I am. I don't know if his prophecies are necessarily correct, but I believe his goals are in the right place. It just feels like everything's coming very quickly, and we may need to deal with it quite soon. So I don't know if I'll be coming back at all. And if I do, I don't know when. Come back. I'll do everything in my power to do, so I just don't know. No. Varys kind of stands up. You'll come back. Broken arm. Shattered ribs, whatever it takes. You come back. I think Vesper just gets up and hugs him. Yeah. Um, gosh, dang it. Um, I just want to say thank you before I go to you and turning to Dia and you and to Lysander and you for, for making me the woman that I am today, for teaching me to protect myself, to heal, to fight, to giving me everything I needed to succeed. I, I wouldn't have made it this far without any of you. We couldn't ask for a better daughter. Your father's right. Return. Plus, I'm sure I'll have you work on that temple some more. <laughs> Can you use some help around here, too? I'll you'll come need, here. You'll need something to do after you save the world. <laughs> yeah. I just... I love all of you so much, and I just wanted to say that before I go. Uh, Varys, in his kind of stoic way, embraces you again, again, kind of silently, 
um, as the other two fold in as well. And I think that's where she'll leave it. Okay. And during that embrace, um, as we're fading out, you feel a kind of warmth from Varys and from Dia and, and from Lysander as well. Something beyond just physical um, or emotional. Right. Um, does that bring us up to the next day? I think. I'll take your silence as a yes. I think so. Okay. <laughs> uh, were y'all meeting at the copper sale? I know that's kind of typical, but wherever you guys wanted to. Uh, the gates to this hell hole. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Um, um, I was hoping to do one very brief errand before we leave. I don't think it'll take long, but I would ask Ball if he would like to go with me for a few minutes over to Amble home. Yeah, sure. Um, Ball will go with you. What do you need to do there? Uh, it's not much, but I've been thinking about how fortunate I've been that I have a family that took me in, and there are kids here who didn't have that, who haven't been as lucky as me. And I just want to give something for those kids. So you approach the small orphanage, simple wooden structure. It's kind of beside the Odysseic Harbor. Mostly just a kind of larger bunk room where the kids stay, and uh, a kitchen, and eating area, and then an office, one office for the sort of uh, matron that helps keep this place. So I am going to kind of look at a, look around at the kids, the the state of the place, what they have here, and I'm going to go over to the office and find the person who runs things. Yeah. Uh, inside is a woman. Um this at a desk looks like she's reading through a ledger of some sort. And Ball, you recognize her as Miss Flint. Um, she's probably at this point in her early thirties, mid thirties, uh, brown hair to the shoulders, or a stark white blouse and black pants. Uh, very well kept, but simple clothes. Yes. Uh, hi. My name hey, is. Yep. Hi, Ball. Hello, Mrs. Flint. How are you? Very well. You remember your lessons? And what could I do for you, dear? My friend here wanted to speak with you. What about? Ellery, this is Mrs. Flint. Uh, I reach out to shake her hand. Pleasure to meet you. It's a pleasure to meet you, too. Thank you for taking such good care of my friend. We did what we could with what we have. Um, I was hoping that I could add a little bit to what you have. And I am mm -hmm. and I'm going to pull out wait, I wrote down somewhere how much I wanted this to be. Where did I write that? Ten gold. Uh and four copper. Oh wait, I knew I remember what I was Just a to sock do. full of coal. What I pull out is the emerald eye that I took from the Unbox City. I take that gem and I place it into her hand. This is quite substantial. Um, I forgive me, I'm not an expert in uh, gemstones. Do you know how much this is? This is worth. We'll have to convert it, of course. It's about five hundred gold. <sighs> Don't accept anything less than that for it. She kind of places it on the desk, um, kind of in awe, looking at it. It's kind of fairly small. Fairly large for an emerald, but small little gems no more so much. Uh, this is incredible. Is this something we will sometimes um, notify the city of, of benefactors and, and their names? Um, would you like us to do that as well? Or we can maybe have a plaque made? Or That's not necessary. I just want... I just want these kids to be taken care of. This will go a long way to ensuring that. And she goes up from her desk and comes around it, gives you a hug and then ball hug. 
Thank you. This means a lot. Thank you for the work that you do. Just a servant. Uh, and with that, my business there is done. Okay. Um, she takes it and like, puts it away and hugs you both again and thanks you again um, and says her farewells, especially at a ball. Take care of yourself, big guy. You too. I know those little kids can be a handful. They can. Sometimes more than one. Uh, and with that, now, meeting outside the gates? Uh, yeah. Well, yes. Ellery was fruitlessly spending our money. Can I have gotten <laughs> us directions and, like, I don't know, any advice on sure. what we can expect in that area? Give me an investigation check. Can hey, can I do that? have gone with Felix and help? Uh, sure. We don't imagine Vesper and Amster have Vesper and Amson have much to do in the morning, so. <laughs> well. Ew. E. Um. <laughs> uh, investigation. Investigation is twenty-one. Twenty-one. Okay. With a twenty-one, you ask around, get a little bit of the detail about some of the surrounding areas just north. There's the Timberlands to the north. Well, there's more Thon than the Timberlands beyond that. And then farther north, uh, there's a Dwarven um, Citadel beyond that. Um, it's kind of hard to get to very far. Sometimes I'll do trade by ship, um, but then by land quite a good bit to get up there. But the most of the information you get is actually when you're pointed to a hole-in-the-wall business called Blackwater Expeditions. It's this kind of failing business that's clearly hasn't seen many customers, but it's this old organization of cartographers and pathfinders. Uh, looks like they're on the edge of bankruptcy, but they actually had an expedition that went into Tynir um, a number of years ago, maybe about a decade ago, um, and has numerous uh, rough maps, hand-drawn uh, maps, some of them are clearly done on the expedition. They're kind of rough. Some of them were done when they got back and are more clear. They offer to sell you this package wholesale um, for 15 gold. Yeah, I'll take it. Okay. So the path they took, because they left from Embershore as well, um, they went north to the Mortham ruins. They circled around it because at the time the Valgrith and the Valrin were a big problem then. Um, they cross the River Saber. It kind of runs northwest to east. Past of that, they went through the Balkan Timberlands, through the Timberlands, where there are some brigands that they had to kind of skirt around. And then they went to Roost Ridge, which is this uh, long mountain range that runs from the northeast down to the northwest. Uh, fairly wide range as well, with many fjords and rivers, um, a few bridges that they crossed, uh, and then they passed through the mountain. There's a mountain pass marked, because otherwise crossing the mountains would be quite treacherous. Passed through the mountains, and then they went north to the Hillgrad Range, um, where there are almost these sheer cliffs, these almost walls they describe that aren't like mountains at all, but more of cliff faces rising up like glaciers out of the snow. Um, and they move through there to get into time here. So you get a pretty good map and a pretty good idea of the path to take. But otherwise, you can take that information and that packet and that, I presume meet outside the wall. Well, Ball, are you ready? Yes, I think I am. We've been here for a while. I think it's time to go. Well, where are we actually going? Uh, God. <laughs> uh, oh, sorry, I was typing something. So if if you wanted to find the same path, and this is kind of where we're going to go into the journey mode, which I told you guys about and sent you that right up. But essentially, it's just a different kind of mode of play where you won't get long rest. You can get short rest. And we'll kind of zoom in on particular scenes that can kind of exemplify the terrain or the fauna or floor or whatever's there and how you kind of get over it. So it'll be a skill challenge instead of skill challenges. And the challenges in particular are determined by what route you want to take. So if you wanted to basically mimic 
the route in that Blackwater expedition pamphlet or not pamphlet, but booklet you got, um, you can certainly do that. So you, this is the point where you determine your route. So looking at this information, so where do places like um, Ustax and uh, what is the the name Volenberg. of that area? Yeah, Volenberg. Um, yeah. So Inverashore is, is on the coast and to the northwest um, is the Ustax mountain range. The river Saber runs from Ustax to the coast. This map path crosses that river, but closer to the coast than to Ustax, um, a couple of days away from the coastline. Vallenberg is on the west side of the Ustax mountain range. Um, so there are another couple of days of the mountain range to get to Vallenberg. So this, this map mostly has you going north, mostly along the coast, until you get to the Roost Ridge, at which point you go northwest to get to that mountain range and eventually cross it before heading north. And then I'm aware that, um, I'm trying to remember the name of this, of the, uh, uh, the Elf Lands? Dramenvo? Something like that? Yeah, that's on the west side of, um, okay. the Uztax Mountain Range. Okay. Uh, did we, um, just found it in my notes. The, when we had the ghost apple and Vesper asked all this too before we left, there was um something in there that we we picked up the locket. Did we know where that was supposed to go? I think it was supposed to be a village that was near Vallenberg. So it's super out of our way. On the other side of the stacks, yeah. Oh, yeah, fuck. so that okay. Never mind. Basically what I wanted to do to figure out is if that stuff would be on the way or out of the way. And it sounds like it's more out of the way. Yeah, it'd be pretty pretty out of the way. Okay. From this pr- this route. I vote we just follow the map. Uh, maybe don't have to cut or avoid the area where the Volgrith was, if that saves time. But That'll save a few days, yeah. They took a quite a wide berth around that, so that would knock out a few days there. Yeah, we can just go straight through Morthom, take a look at what they're doing with the place. Okay. Well, with that, we'll go ahead and start the journey. Did everyone get a chance to read over that? If not, I'll give you a brief recap. I'll do a recap anyway. Um, so it's a skill challenge. Um, I'll present a obstacle you'll have to overcome that kind of is a good example, so to speak, of the terrain in the area. And then one of you can choose to head the attempt to get around it. So you can basically justify or say however you want to do it. Do you want to sneak around it? Do you want to climb over, fly over, whatever it is? And then one of you will roll one skill check. The DC is based on what you're trying to overcome and how you're trying to do it. So it gives you a chance to kind of narrate um, how you want to try to get around that obstacle. Um, Each time you fail, there'll be a consequence. um, And success can have positive consequences as well. The big thing is, um, since you could, you know, let's say a bridge is out, you could just cast fly and fly over it. Um, You'll gain no long rest over the course of the journey. Um, until the journey ends. You can still do short rest, um, but no long rest, just to, to make it an actual challenge. And I think that's about it. Uh, oh, if you say you want to sneak through the Timberlands or something, uh, that same character can't lead a sneak in another challenge. Someone else can, but you can't repeat the same skill. I think that's about it. Do you guys have any questions about that? Nope. Okay, we'll kind of see how it how it goes, trying something new here, and we'll see if it works or not. So you guys get your stuff. I think Ellery asked for some shopping stuff. I'll send you that shortly. And you guys say goodbye one last time, and then head north. You guys move out of the city, passing by Ball's camp. Oh, one last thing I want to say about it is we won't do long rest and perception checks and all of that, but you will still be narratively having campfires and rest or whatever so if you guys wanted to say something or whatever that's that's still viable so you guys are heading north out of the city you guys head past ball's camp along the sort of tree line to the left and to the uh, right the cliff and the ocean hard to see the emberstones glowing under the waters during the day but 
You see the waters kind of rising and falling uh, with the tide as you guys head north through the woods, and eventually the cliff begins to elevate, get taller, the sheer cliffs, to the point where you reach the cliffs of Navo, where Orsisis was. I'm going to see down below and see where that cave was long ago. No movement, though. You guys continue north for the next couple of days, having camps and eating rations and maybe hunting or eating or whatever. Um, as you head north, and eventually you see the cliffside rising up further ahead of you, where you see the city of Morthon, the ruins of it, the outer walls, and you see a few fires as well. Traveling through, you see there's actually a small covenant outpost where they've kind of used some wood to augment a previous structure watchtower and have started to build kind of a little trade post here. It's not much of anything right now. It's just kind of an external outpost, but uh, you can see they're trying to kind of take it back. And that will be where we start to come into the first obstacle of the journey, which is crossing the River Saber. It is a pretty rough river. But the difficulty really comes in how wide the river is. The water rushes through. There's um, boulders kind of on the edges, rocks on the edges, and a few on the inside as well. Um, even an island as well. But it's a pretty extensive, maybe 150 yards wide. It's a pretty wide river. So how do you guys want to plan to get across this? And who wants to lead it? I suppose they have a ferry. There's no ferry. Okay. Do we get any sense of the uh like how raging this river is? Uh it's it's maybe a six out of ten. It's not a white river rapid, but it's it's no joke. And there's no bridge. No bridge. I know that we all have or at least a bunch of us have individual ways to get across. Um, but I don't know if we necessarily want to go you know, using all of our high-level spells just to get across, right? Oh, I suppose I do have a question about the journey rules. Since narratively we're narratively we're taking long rests, do we have access to all of our possible spells or only what we prepare at the start of the journey? Uh, I'll say what you prepare at the start of the journey for now. Okay. Great, then I don't have water walk either. <laughs> um... Why don't you all from Embershore, just to give you some more information, roll a nature check for me. Okay. Actually, I'll say Felix, you can do it too if you're proficient. Uh, 21 20. for ball. 21 for Vesper. Six. I am not proficient. Okay. Those who got 21, Vesper and Ball, um, you know that the river is part of the danger, but the other part is the creatures in it. There's been a few tales of fishermen and other individuals who are just trying to traveling merchants or just refugees traveling from the Balkan Timberlands to the north of this river that have mentioned creatures in the water. And with a 21, you get what you thought at the time maybe were campfire stories told to entertain the bar crowd late at night uh, about these water river trolls um, that will sometimes wait in the water for someone to cross before grabbing them and trying to drown them. So this might be a danger as well as other gator-like creatures and giant crabs as well, and of course uh, the saber tooth gar fish. Can I, um, what are those things called? Piranha-like fish in the rivers as well. Yeah, you thought you just had to cross the river. No, you're going to get killed by everything that touches. Gotta love everyone. <laughs> um, shit. And how wide did you say it was? Maybe 150 yards. So definitely. There's some places where it's more narrow. Farther than I can get with Thunderstep, though. Yeah, probably. Felix, your um creepy head thing can it fly? Yes. Would it be able to see kind of? far away whether or not there is a significantly more narrow path? Uh, I think it can only get a certain distance from me before it disappears. But let me double check that. Oh, I just remembered something that we have. 
didn't know I should pick my last spell. Um, we have a flying staff. Oh, right. Hmm. Now, it can't carry all of us, but it could help with the process. Can we ferry ourselves out? Like, can two, I mean, ball's still an issue, but I could levitate him and have you drag him across. Uh, ball's probably too heavy. I could cast fly on ball and everybody else can ferry on the broom. <laughs> um, I've got a spell I can do. It's If it's 150 feet away, I think... Uh, 150 yards. 150 yard. Oh, yards. Wait, is this just... I mean, I'm Canadian. 150 yard river, is that just like... Fucking 300 stupid? feet. Okay, so Google says 450 feet, so I don't think... <laughs> Never mind yeah. then. Yeah, you're yeah, the this gun it's a big one. Yeah. I could do a far step across. That's one of my new spells, hint hint. But it's my fifth level spell. Why don't I cast fly on you and the rest of us should be able to slowly with the stick go back and forth. That works. Okay. And and this is a good point I didn't say earlier, but sometimes you'll have abilities or spells or whatever. That will give you advantage on rolls or just auto succeed, as is this case, which is why it, there's no long rest. Um, so you can spin that spell slot and just clear this automatically if that's how you want to do it. Yeah, I think so. Okay. Uh, so yeah, you guys are ferried across by the the broom and Felix cast fly on ball. You're kind of flying straight over the wide river as it rushes below you, as the last of you are ferrying across and. Balls going over as well. You start to see some movement in the waters, peeking their heads up. You can see these kind of seaweed-like dreads kind of floating in the water, drifting to the side. Uh, as two creatures kind of poke their heads up, and you leave them in the dust. You see. Um, get to the other side, continuing northward past the River Saber and into the Balkan Timberlands. This is a kind of rough terrain that slows you down a bit, filled with numerous of these thick blue pines. And there's a few camps you can tell in the area as smoke kind of rolls up into the sky. Y'all give me a history check. Anyone that's proficient in history, give me a history check. Uh, 16. Uh, <laughs> that's a natural 20, so that's 34. <laughs> Holy shit. All right. Just y'all two. Yeah, I'm not proficient in history. Okay. Uh, so, Vesper, you get a little bit, you know there's these brigands called the Umbrigan that are native to these Timberlands, these kind of rough and tumble kind of people, a lot of outlaw-esque kind of people. Felix, I'll say with that score, I don't know if you heard this in a bar or where you heard it, but you're aware that there are raiders that were from this land, and this individual known as King Cald was from the Balkan Timberlands. And a lot of the people in this land follow him and kind of follow that way of life. Get in boats, or they'll ride horses out to various villages outside of the Timberlands, raid them, take stuff, and come back here. Y'all both are aware the King Cald was defeated at Ustax by Wormai, his half-sister, um, but his remains weren't found. It's not clear if he was dead or alive, but you know the danger in crossing the Balkan Timberlands is the Umbrigans, these rough raiders, these Viking-esque kind of people. So with that, how did you guys want to get across this obstacle? Probably being sneaky. Yeah, and I don't know if Ball's necessarily concerned about running into a few raiders. Like, we're a pretty tough group. I mean, we could be sneaky, or we could try and be intimidating and show them that they don't want to mess with us. That's true. We know they speak giant, right? Yeah, yeah. So yeah you know that. Maybe Ball takes point if we're trying to be intimidating. And Do if he's not concerned. To believe they might know something about the giant we are looking for? We're still super far away. Right. Okay. Um, in that case, yeah, Ball can take the lead and Ball make it clear that, um, like, we shouldn't, um, with these types of savages, we should be prepared to intimidate with force. I don't know if 
talking to them will be the best strategy. I don't know. They were fairly interested in you because you're giant kin. Maybe we can use that to our advantage. Perhaps they'll even lead us through this area if we're persuasive enough or intimidating enough. I will see what I can do. I'm not as good a communicator as the rest of you. Vesper scoffs at that, but I will cast Enhance Ability on him. And can I back him up on this since I have proficiency in intimidation? I mean, you can narratively, but I won't say there's a help action during this, because otherwise everyone would be at advantage all the time. Oh, right. I seem to remember. But you can narratively back him up. Yeah, so narratively, if we run into anyone who tries to give us trouble, I will use Thaumaturgy to try and make us a little bit more intimidating. Sure. And and Ball, so you're, are you going more just marching straight through with the plan of intimidating everyone? Or are you going to talk to them? What's your, what skill are you aiming to roll? I think, well, oh, if it's, go ahead. One, one last thing. I don't know if this pertains to this, but I meant to mention it. Um, thinking about barbarians and fighters, they don't have a lot of skills. You can use like your attack as a skill. Same rule, you can't do it more than once over the journey, but you could potentially use like a weapon attack saying, I will just fight our way through um, as another option. It's tough here because what do I do in the case that it's like, if I'm, it's a bit more reactionary, like depends on what they do, what I do. Okay. But you're going to go for one of those two? Yeah. So Ball's intention here is he's basically going to say, like, I highly suggest you stay out of my way. And if saying that and looking all tough doesn't quite do the trick, then he will explain to get out of the way by using his weapons. Okay, I see. So it sounds like intimidation is the first. Yeah, like plan A, intimidate, plan B, fight. Fight. Okay, that would be the consequence of failure. So to kind of paint this picture as you guys head into the Timberlands, you know you'll be in there for a few days and the first two, three days go by without really any incident. You can every now and then you can see fires kind of in the distance nearby you, but they don't come close. There is one night where you're set up your own campfire and eating around it, kind of preparing to bed down for the night, and we start to hear some sounds coming out of the bushes. Behind you at first, you hear some noises, and then you realize they're all around you, a number of them. And they kind of all at once begin to come into the light of the campfire, the kind of orange light dancing on their faces. And you see a number of them, maybe seven or eight of them, all with wild hair, men, women, tall, um, wearing furs and carrying weapons, axes, a bow. Um, You see one broader, taller individual, older, gray-bearded veteran um, who kind of steps forth. Seems you don't know where you're headed. Sometimes I to teach people like you a lesson. And so, Ball, what do you do since you're leading this part? Ball will, uh, I mean, let me know if it's just, you just want me to stick strictly to the kind of abilities, but Ball will kind of ignite his um, bicep bracelet, his crown, and say, I... Son of Vladis, know exactly where I'm headed. Is this intimidation? Yes. Okay. In Good giant. In giant, okay. Good roll intimidation. Uh, that's a 21. So as that arm bracelet burns, that crown around your bicep and fire, uh, all the raiders, these Umbregans, kind of take a step back, putting their weapons kind of in between you and them, but still eyeing and looking around each other uncertain. The veteran gray beard kind of takes a step back as well, tilting his head to the side, switching over to giant. Son of Vladis. He kind of bows his head. He kind of sticks his uh, large claymore down into the ground, bowing over it. Then blessings of Tyrus upon you, brother. Blessings on your journey. Does Ball know anything about what would be a proper response? Like, is it just like, and also with you? Uh, you probably don't know, but you could, you know, go for it. 
yeah, maybe Ball does something like that where he's just kind of like uh Ball kind of does one of these awkward noble nods and just mi- imi- like imitates what this individual's nod looked like and says uh and blessings upon you as well. Don't stick your neck out here. Take this. And he reaches in his pocket and pulls out this simple wooden symbol. It's kind of tea mixed with a Claymore-esque imagery. Kind of like a cross on a simple, thin thread. Would normally fit around a person's neck, but for you it might be a wrist symbol in the tyrus. If you and any others stand in your way, show them this. I think, um, kind of more as an exchange, Ball will kind of reach into his pouch and pull out one of these, uh, I'm just looking at what I have in my inventory. Uh, he's got a bearded devil horn, and he's going to take one of those out and kind of say, similarly, if, uh, something like, uh, if we were to ever meet again. If you show me this, I will know you are a friend. Friend, indeed. He kind of looks to the other Umbrigans, the raiders around you. Gives them the whistle and a head tilt um, as they kind of back up into the forest um, once more. He stands in the light for another moment, meeting Ball's eyes for backing up itself. And you guys have a few more days of crossing in the Timberlands. Every now and then you'll see a a hunter or someone, but other than that, everyone steers clear of you. And again, y'all feel free if y'all wanted to talk or say anything around the campfire, but otherwise we'll move to the next leg of the journey. So y'all spend about uh, six days or so moving through the Balkan Timberlands, um, heading north where eventually you start to raise in altitude. Um, Start moving into the foothills of the Rost Ridge, where the map indicates you start to turn northwest, heading towards that mountain pass. And as you're heading this way, the altitude is rising, and you see more creeks, and eventually these kind of narrow but white rapid rivers rushing below these fjords. But you're following this trail alongside, following these rivers and fjords up and into the Rust Ridge. At this point, it's becoming cold. You're starting to enter into winter, and the altitude as well makes it uh, not quite frigid, but it's beginning to be so. Um, As you're moving along, you eventually come to a fjord where the booklet from the Blackwater Expedition indicates a bridge. But as you get there, these large stones, these anchors, where the bridge was anchored to, um, the bridge itself is out. This long fjord down below going maybe 150 feet down. The fjord's only about 100 feet wide or so to cross to the other side. Maybe not that far, maybe 80 feet to the other side of this bridge, but it's out. If you all get across. Oh, can you still do that? really far jump or I can travel great distances however I cannot take anyone with me I can carry one person with me and Amson can cast Dimension Door and take one of us across does that get us all? how many are those now? five? (laughs) yeah five okay you want to do that and spend those spell slots? Um, how far away is it? Well, 80 feet across and 100, I think it's at 25-ish feet down into a rushing cold river. Is that what you guys do? Yes. Ball, Mission. you can get across, right? Yeah. So Hamson is going to do Dimension Door. Ball is going to jump. Is that right? Um, I'm going to use, you said it's 80 feet across? Um, I will use, um, just a quick question. Would, I think we talked about this. I can't remember what we concluded. If I use the spell fire form, the one that turns me into like a tiny little flame, am I restricted to just moving on, on land or does it let me kind of go airborne as well? I, you can go airborne. 
we'll say okay. that for now. No. Sure. It, it, it just makes a difference of a couple of sorcery points. I think then, yeah, I'll just use fire form and then just dashed across. Okay. So fire form for ball. Um, I guess I will thunderstep with Felix and let Amson dimension door Vesper over. Okay. So if you guys spin those spell slots, there's no reason to roll. You can just get to the other side. All right, so Amson Dimension Dooring with Vesper Ball turning into fire and sh- streaking across in flames and Ellery thunderstepping uh, with a loud crack to the other side with Felix. Uh, we get to the other side of the fjord and are able to continue along your way, heading farther, higher in altitude into the Roost Ridge, this kind of jagged mountain range uh, with numerous fjords and cliffs, sheer walls. Eventually, you're heading alongside the ridge. You can see it far above, heading towards the mountain pass. Is there anything you guys want to do for the next kind of four days or so as you're doing that? The night before we reach the mountain pass, I'll want to take a watch as well. Okay. And we'll say at this point, with the altitude, um, you kind of have the campfire burning dim. There's a thin layer of snow up here. And you aren't past the tree line yet, but there are um, a few thinning trees kind of around you, those same blue pines reaching up, um, as well as this underbrush of briars below. Yeah, so that night, right before we reach the mountain pass where we're going to enter into Tynir, uh, Vesper will take a watch with Ball, wait to make sure everyone else is asleep before she starts talking to him and Giant. Are you excited? I suppose. I I don't quite know what to expect. Yeah, it's it's all rather unexpected. I didn't expect sorry, um Klaus, were they did you call them the the, the Rough Riders, the Viking guys? What did you call them? Uh Umbrig. Just I don't the butcher. Raiders. Okay, the Raiders, okay. I I didn't expect the Raiders to recognize me. Or recognize Vladis. I don't even know what Vladis looks like. Or if I am even the son of any Vladis. It might be more symbolic than literal. You know, descendant of of hers. Do you think we might find your parents? I think my parents says I knew them. Whereas you know your parents. I believe my parents died long ago, but I could be wrong. I have been wrong before. I suppose we'll have to wait and see. Um, Vesper's going to get up and sit next to Ball and just kind of put her hand on his arm. Whatever happens, though, Ball, whatever we find, you're always going to be my brother, okay? We will always be family. She'll give his arm a squeeze and fall quiet. Okay. Um, anything else before we get to the next obstacle? All right. Um, so you guys continue for the next four days or so, climbing higher and higher along um, narrow, more narrow and more narrow paths with a sheer drop to the right and to the left, this kind of sheer wall that goes up towards the top of the ridge far above you. The wind is howling. Um, as the snow is kind of blowing in flurries, um, wrapping around the side of this uh, roost ridge, this mountain range. As you're moving, there's moonlight streaming down from a crescent above you. Um, The partially of the moonlight is covered by clouds. Um, And you guys can hear this... This echoing off the sides of the walls and this dissonant notes of numerous of wolves howling against each other. You move faster, but you can hear them moving up behind you. These kind of uh, loud footfalls growling. They get catch up closer and closer to where you can hear their footfalls into the snow. You can hear the snapping of twigs as they run over them. Um, as they're rushing uh, behind you. As this happens, you rush into 
towards the mountain pass, trying to outrun them, or not. So you have wolves that are stalking you, hunting you. How do you overcome this? Do you try to outrun them? Try to, do you try to hide from them? What do you try? Should we just fight them? Since we're, you know, level 11 and they're wolves? Yeah, my impulse is to either fight or at least enough to try and scare off the rest of them. Not too bothered about hiding from wolves. Uh, yeah, we're, we're little wolves and we're basically heroes. If they're I don't sure. necessarily always count that they're little wolves, but uh, yeah, I'm down to fight. La when was I ever wrong? That like that one time that there was that one creature that turned out to be a hydro when we were level Yeah, one? how how many times have we been humbled by? <laughs> 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 Any time we've gone, we're the protagonist, we got this. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so uh, I'm all for it, but, uh, mm -hmm. you know, cautiously. I've got Revivify, it's fine. Yeah, I, th I think my <laughs> impulse is to especially focus on throwing fire around to see if we can just get them to scatter without having to fight too much, but... Well, I'll, I'll leave this to y'all. The journey kind of idea says that you could do a skill check and try to, whatever, uh, scare them off or fight them without actually doing combat. Um, and if that's what you guys want to do, you can. If you guys basically want to jump into combat because we haven't in a while, uh, you guys can choose to do that. But I'm not going to impose it unless you fail your check. So I'll let you guys have that choice. Um, I will say as the wolves get on your heels closer and closer, they are larger than your standard wolves. They also wings. have wings and blow fire? Uh, there aren't wings, but you do see a cold, misty breath coming off of their fangs as they're rushing behind you, intermittently leaping between the trees. Can win our wolves. Well, I, I mean, I still think uh, Fall feels like we are a very capable group, and if some wild wolves think that we're going to be easy dinner, they're going to find out otherwise. Well, I'll put it this way. Um, you guys can either choose, hey, let's just have a fun combat and hopefully we don't die, or you can have someone roll a skill check and describe how that skill check is supposed to overcome the wolves. Your choice. I'm up for either way, but if we don't want to jump into a fight, I could try and lead scaring them off with throwing fire around. I, you know what? I'm kind of down for the fight. We got spanked the last time we did anything a couple times now. Like, they weren't, they were scary. I'm okay with hopefully not a near death experience fighting some wolves. Sure. Yeah. And again, I want those pelts. <laughs> yeah, that's a good point. It's, it's cold. cold. <laughs> you will not get the pelts if you're all checked. So the consensus is y'all are choosing to, to fight, basically. Sure. Okay, yeah. just wait until we see the battle map, and it's just like, oh, look, there's 42 wolves. Oh, oh. <laughs> I have maps for everything. And they're all two by two. Oh, you know, oh. maybe we do skill check instead. <laughs> Hashtag wolves. I'm not that cold. I'm fine. <laughs> Hashtag wolves. Okay. Uh, Y'all go ahead and roll in whatever. Invest uh, initiative. Initiative, that one. <sighs> not amazing. Okay. Actually, wait. Hey, see, Ellery doesn't always roll high initiative. This is the first time I've ever seen such. All right, it's, like, it's still the second idea. highest. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, are we breaking before combat? Um, yeah. Why don't y'all take a quick, quick break while I get an initiative set? Next time, on back to the story. And as you get closer, you see them. These three large. Monuments, one of a sword made of stone kind of stricken into the ground, one of a massive hammer of an anvil slammed into the ground, and the third of an axe forming this triangle, each one maybe 30 feet or so. And in the center, kind of partially covered by snow, tilted to the side, is a skull of a dragon.
For part two of this episode of Back to the Story, you can find it on SoundCloud, Spotify, iTunes, or wherever you prefer to get your podcasts. We also have a YouTube channel 